Hi, I'm Helen Quinn from Dairy Australia. Thank you for joining us in this important discussion. The Productivity Project is an economic research project that we've undertaken to progress the Australian Dairy Plan profitability discussion, which highlighted that dairy farm productivity has been flat over the last decade. To help get today's discussion started, we've spoken to six respected people from across the dairy industry and asked them how flat productivity is impacting on their business. Yeah, so if you think about productivity, you know, and think about um, what potentially has um, been a blocker for some innovation adaption, probably the the reality is we've had 15 pretty tough years in dairy from perhaps the early 2000s to 2018 or 19 or 20, depending where you were. Um, so you kind of understand why people are slightly more conservative in their risk taking, uh, whether they're going to buy that new technology. It's been tough enough to maintain your business, not necessarily want to take on every new, new innovation and adaption. The mental load of future-proofing our businesses with increased expectations and information on things like social licence, attracting and retaining staff and achieving our sustainability goals diverts our attention from farming efficiently. Yeah, so most of my clients that are struggling with the productivity side, it's been that volatility that's been the cause of it. Um, so the impact that's having on some of them is that it's slowed down their ability to grow their business and it's also lowered their profitability at times, um, being that being more investing in risk adverse strategies rather than productivity strategies. So it's lowered profitability and slowed their growth. It doesn't directly impact their business, but I do think it impacts the industry. Um, in Western Australia, you know, we're obviously a very small dairying state and, and, and most of our growth and opportunity is really tied directly to the strategic plans of the processes who operate here. If they're not looking for growth and investment, then that's reflected in the milk price that's sent back to the farms. Productivity is important for our business to ensure that we get a good return from every investment that we make, regardless of whether it's a capital investment a production cost investment or a labour investment. It's what makes a business profitable and sustainable. There's some food for thought to get this discussion underway. So I'll hand back to our host, Sarah Thompson. Welcome everyone to week two of the Productivity Forum. I'm thrilled to see so many people returning again after week one, but also the new additions that are joining us for the first time this week too. For the newcomers, my name is Sarah Thompson and I'm your host for these online sessions that make up the Productivity Forum. And I'm really lucky to be working with um, our gun speakers each week to bring you brand new findings about all things dairy productivity. At the start of each session, you will notice we are showing you a pre-recorded video, which provides comments and thoughts from a number of different people. Each video is specific to each session. So whilst you may notice the same faces in the videos each week, the content of the panel member, what the panel members are saying does change. I'd like to start with a couple of quick reminders to ensure you all have the best experience possible online today. Firstly, if your internet allows it, please turn your camera on, we'd love to see you. Secondly, with your Zoom screen, you have the option of switching between uh, gallery view and speaker view. I suggest that you select speaker view so that you get to see us up nice and close. Now to do this, you'll look for a little white icon up the top right hand corner of your screen. You will also notice that there's no chat function at these sessions. That's intentional. Instead, you'll see there is an email address above my head, uh, which is productivity at dairyaustralia.com.au. We are asking that all questions comments and feedback is sent through to this email. I'd also like to thank everyone who has submitted questions thus far. We have received quite a few and each one prompts fantastic discussion. We'll be tackling many of the questions submitted to us later in this session. Lastly, again, this session will be recorded and sent to anyone who has registered. Now, a lot has happened in a week in productivity land. Uh, one of the key activities was that everyone who registered for the forum received a copy of the draft economic report 
that Gavin and his team pulled together. As you heard from some of our panel speakers last week, this is a very detailed and technical report. And we make no apologies about that. This is a research report created by the very best in the business. But also we absolutely acknowledge that for anyone who isn't an economist, which is many of us here today, me included, um, it can be a challenging read. I want you to be assured that down the track, we'll certainly be creating a summary document that has high level messages and is formatted for readability for the broader audience. Now, last week we heard from our expert economist, Gavin Dwyer, who focused on what productivity actually is and the four elements that make up the productivity effect. He presented that along with the initial findings outlining why dairy productivity has flatlined. We then heard from three industry representatives that shared their perspective on the report, each shining a different light on how they made sense of it. This week, first up, we're gonna hear from three different members of the dairy industry, Dan, Michelle, and Jackie, and get their reflections on what they've seen unfold so far. We'll then come back to Gavin to unpack the regional differences in productivity and then finish with an exciting Q&A tackling many of the fabulous yet challenging questions that we've had sent through. So with that, let's launch straight into our panel. These panel sessions, from my perspective, are one of the most important parts of the forum. The insights from each of these members um, really helps paint a picture of what this actually means at a farm level at a regional level, and also at an industry-wide level. So Dan, I'd like to start with you. Dan Armstrong is a farm consultant based in Gippsland in Victoria. Um, he's worked with dairy farming clients for many, many years. So Dan, I'd love to ask, what were your reflections on the productivity findings? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I think the, that plateauing in productivity is pretty consistent with what I've observed over the last 25 years working in the dairy industry. In the 90s, I reckon we were able to put on a lot, a lot of inputs coming from relatively low levels, get really good milk production responses to those and make some big gains in productivity. And I, I guess that was also a period where we had reasonably favourable climatic conditions to aid that. In the last couple of decades, I reckon we've struggled to get those same kind of responses to those extra inputs. As we've sort of moved from medium to high levels, the law of diminishing returns has kicked in more markedly and we've struggled to get the same kind of gains from increasing inputs that step further. And on top of that, a lot of a lot of regions have had some fairly challenging climatic conditions in the last couple of decades. And so it's not really surprising to me that productivity gains have slowed. I reckon the, the really exciting aspect of this work is the ability that this method has to break productivity down into the, the um, four or five key contributing factors and isolate those. And I think that that's got potential to lead to much better decisions in terms of investment into research development and extension into the future. That, um, that investment into rd &E is gonna be critical to, gain, to make those productivity gains in the next, in the next decade. And I think that that, the, that research investment has to have a really strong focus on being multidisciplinary and making sure that the knowledge of farmers, advisors, economists, and, and all those different views are incorporated into the research to ensure that it actually results in productivity gains at a, at a farm level. One of the findings that made a lot of sense to me was the importance of that um, way that mixes of inputs are put together to increase productivity. I think um, yeah, that, that, that obviously has been critical in recent years. And I don't think that barracking for particular farm systems serves as well as an industry 
I think we're much better served by really focusing on our attention on how we can optimise the individual set of resources available to a farm and a region in a particular year to optimise profit and productivity. Um, yeah, opportunities to increase um, productivity by using more inputs are going to be a challenge in the future. And um, following on from Rowan's question last week about what would be the impact of a limit on nitrogen fertiliser use, uh, similar to what's happened in New Zealand, which I thought was a good question. And I think that um, the research in the future is going to need to have a stronger focus on maintaining production from less inputs and probably a lesser, in, lesser emphasis on research that's focused on maximising yield. I think that um, yeah, policy and market pressures are going to, to make that important. Thanks, Sarah. Awesome, Dan, thank you. And look, it's really interesting to hear that this wasn't a surprise for you. And with your experience in the industry, I guess I can understand why. Um, you've made some important points, I guess, about what's occurred in the past and how important this work is for the future of R&D investment, um, not only, you know, for everyone in the industry, really, whether you're a service provider, farmer, or someone working at Dairy Australia. Um, and a good note there around maintaining production from less inputs rather than always pushing for more from less. Thanks, Dan. Um, next, I'd love to see a comment from Michelle. So Michelle Lawrence is a, a dairy farmer based in Tasmania. And for those that attended last week, you may have looked at the graph that outlined all the regions and noticed that Tasmania was a, was a clear standout. Um, Michelle, tell us how you make sense of the productivity flatline for your business and also for your region. Well, first of all, I'm going to apologise because the dog snuck into the room and she's snoring in the background, so I do apologise. Look, I thought it was really um, refresh refreshing to read a report stating that a very high percentage of dairy farms are technically efficient at maximising outputs with given inputs, and I found it refreshing to read that farmers are incrementally adapting over time to weather and climate variability. As farmers, we're constantly seeking to do more with less. And I feel we've reached a stage where the actual mental load of constantly trying to create the next efficiency is impacting our sense of worth, our sense of success, and the fact that we're actually already doing things really well. Um, our challenge on farm is to do more with less to increase productivity. But last year we achieved 1,806 kilograms of milk solids per milking hectare. We achieved 15.3 tonnes of dry matter harvested per milking hectare. We achieved a kilogram of milk solids per kilogram of live weight. What tools can you give us to achieve more with less? Tools that we can actually access. Um, gene edited ryegrass is the obvious one for us but because of contradictory Tasmanian government policy that wants agriculture to grow, but it restricts our access to that technology. And we were told this morning that silage plastic has gone up 22%. So we need another option. And it's just one example of the cost pressures we face. Um, and I also resonated with the report saying that contribution of technical change has been weak because it it confirms how we feel on farm. The technologies that we're using now are more about trying to achieve all of the non-productivity related elements of our business. So making our workplaces safer and more people oriented, um, supporting technical skill and improving communication, improving our animal welfare and being environmentally proactive and protecting our social license to operate. These are all really highly valued elements of our business but they come at a cost to our profitability as they increase our inputs and they're not recognised in our milk price. Um, in the report, I also found the discussion around scale and mix efficiency interesting. I live in a state where the productivity has increased, but I really wonder at the cost this has come to the diversity of our industry and to the sustainability of our industry. In 1979-80, there were over 1,500 dairy farms in the state. We now sit around 390. Our average herd size is over 400, larger than other states. And 60, over 60% 60 of our cows are corporate owned. 
So as we seek greater investment in the industry, I do wonder at the environmental sustainability of dairy in TADS. How much more can we? How much more should we produce? Do we, um, oh, as we strive for increased productivity, will we pay a price, like Dan said, for a no limit attitude to investment and end up with a New Zealand model of regulation, along with the demise of the social licence we've worked hard to achieve? So I feel that we need to mitigate those perverse outcomes. Otherwise, any productivity gains may not be realised. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Michelle. And look, another confirmation, I guess, of what this work says um, and refreshing for you to hear. Um, and I think you made a really good point that there is a really good news story here. Farmers are doing things very well with, what, with what's available. Um, so the focus has to be more broadly and new things coming through. Um, and also some interesting comments around there for, um, from a Tasmanian perspective, um, which is a bigger conversation too, Michelle. Thank you. Now, last, I will come to Jackie. So Jackie Bidoff is a dairy farmer based over in Western Australia. Um, and Jackie, I've been lucky in the lead up to this to hear um, quite a lot of your thoughts um, as we yeah, progress to these sessions. Um, they've certainly immensely helped me. Um, so Jackie, I'd love you to share your insights thus far on productivity, on productivity with everyone here today. Over to you, Jackie. Uh, thanks, Sarah. You can hear me. I've unmuted, done the right you, stuff. You're good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> When I first glanced at this report, to be honest, I thought it was actually quite depressing. I thought, blimey, 20 years, no productivity, what's all that about? Um, and a couple of days later, I actually read a report that had come out on the ABC saying that pretty well Australia, virtually every industry was in exactly the same boat. And funnily enough, that made me feel a bit better. It wasn't just us. Um, so then when I got into it, um, like Michelle, I, probably the things that stood out to me firstly were the vast majority of farmers who have taken up all the technologies that have been available to us, you know, for the last 20 plus years, and they're implementing them and they're actually implementing them pretty well. Um, but we have been leaving in a, a, a near recent period of enormous volatility. You know, we've had droughts, floods, fires, high grain prices, water prices, you name it, we've had it right across the country in various forms. But it's also those technologies that have actually helped farmers stay alive, stay in their businesses largely, um, and that's kept us all in there. So that's the good stuff. Um, the downside in that report is that it's really highlighted to me is, you know, negative terms of trade is not a place that we want to be. And if we're there for any length of time, we're going to damage our profitability long term. So... I guess we've always known that, you know, we can't control costs, we can influence costs to a degree, and technology does that for us. So we've got, you know, variable speed drives and shed designs and, you know, nutrition programs and all those things. They're the sorts of technologies that we've been able to pick up and have kept us in the game. But I'm with Michelle, we cannot stay on this hamster wheel. Um, and I agree totally with the report when it tells us that we need new technologies if we're gonna keep going in this industry and moving forward. And, and, you know, we need technologies that are gonna give us some breathing space, some uh, leaps forward, some, uh, some room to move. And, you know, um, at the same time, I don't wanna work any harder and I'm not sure that anybody else does either. So what do these technologies actually look like? Well, I'm a bit dim, I don't really know. I think some of them are way out there. Some of them may be just around the corner. But I've got a long list if anyone happens to be interested. And right at the top of my list at this moment in time is give me a calf that has a robust adaptive immune system so that it can cope with the challenges of E. coli, crypto, um, salmonella, rotavirus, coronavirus. Can't someone out there tweak those little genomes and get that happening? And what about these drones I hear about? You know, we know that they're out there measuring biomass, but, but give me some quality, you know, send it to my computer zhoosh it into my pasture rotation for the next week and zap it out again to the apps on everybody's phones. And I won't have to trudge around the farm for two or three hours every week with a plate maker. So it's those sorts of things that I think are going to make a difference to our business. But the kicker is, if we want those sorts of things, we're really going to have to invest in them. Um, and as an industry, we're going to have to invest in them. The corporates will do whatever makes them money as an industry and our industry bodies and researchers and us, we're gonna to have to identify and direct traffic and put that investment where hopefully 
we're going to get the return back to our farm. In order to make that happen, I think we need to keep doing what we are doing, and this report is an example of it, and that is collect data, robust data, facts, year in, year out, state by state. And that will give industry bodies and researchers the irrefutable truth about what our industry is about. Because at the end of the day, my opinion means Scott. Um, so we need that we need that information, and then over to you guys, go and turn it into something that you can deliver back. That'll work on my farm in Western Australia, Michelle's farm in West in uh, Tassie, someone else's farm in New South Wales. It's got to work right across the board. Um, so my final thought on this report, and and, and again, Michelle and I, we've never met, but we must think alike. Um, is there was some really interesting stuff in there on the scale and the mix, the mix being the stuff that we use inside the farm and the scale being just basically farms getting bigger. Now, that really tweaked my interest because the suggestion is that perhaps scale isn't delivering the sorts of improvements and profitability and productivity that we thought it should. Now, I'm old enough to remember that get big, get out mantra that was around. Um, and we've all scaled up, no doubt about it. And don't get me wrong, there's really big farmers out there that are doing it beautifully, but this report suggests that those improvements may not necessarily be across the board. So we need to have a poke around in there and understand why that is and what we can do to change it. So that's it from me and back to you, Sarah. Awesome, Jackie. Thank you. Um, so a bit of a roller coaster of emotions with you with this report at the start. Um, but again, similar to Michelle, there's really an underlying good news story there um, shining through with regards to what farmers have picked up over the past and really pointing towards that need for new technologies to move us forward um, or to give us breathing space, as you say. And I think you made some really good examples of what we're referring to when we talk about technology there as well. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panel members today um, for their ability to help us make sense of all, uh, of all of this information and particularly for the broad audience that is joining us online today. Um, each of you, Dan, Michelle and Jackie, has helped us shape out how we see productivity, um, particularly playing out at different levels, including farm, both regionally and then at an industry setting as well. Now, next up, we have Gavin Dwyer with us again where he'll briefly recap on productivity and how it's measured. Um, he's also going to help us understand the difference between productivity and profitability, because understanding that truly is the foundation needed to understand the meaning of this whole work. And then, as promised, we're going to continue to peel back the layers of productivity by delving into the regional differences when it comes to productivity, which I'm sure you are all extremely eager to hear. I will preface um, in saying that we, we can't go into detail about every single region today, um, but we've picked a few regions that each tell a different productivity story. We also have Dan Armstrong and Tom Farron, who will be ground truthing a few of the regional differences for us as we move through them. But to start, Gavin, it's over to you. Thanks, Eve, Sarah. I'm just going to share my screen and bring up the presentation. Can we all see the, um, the, the lead um, starting screen? Excellent, thank you. Got it, Gab, thank um, you. So today, again, we'll talk about lines and numbers and data and models, but again, I stress this is about real people making real decisions, voting with their feet. This is the analysis drawn from what 850 farmers told us over 20 years of running their farms annually. So we're taking their data and trying to convert it into a form to tell us some meaningful things about profitability. We start off with profitability as where we want to get to because it's our means when we use economic tools to talk ultimately about profit. Profit is the important thing for farmers today, tomorrow, and into the future. Profitability is really just the ratio of revenues to costs over time, and it's how we move towards profit. So if I'm not making a profit, improving my profitability would make me move towards making a profit. And if I'm already making a profit, improving profitability makes me make more of a profit. We're interested in that um, as our goal of getting towards the idea of industry profit over time. Why we look at 
productivity is because it's our way of getting at profitability. But to do that, we have to go through a couple of steps. The first idea is that we really want to take out the price effect out of that profitability. And that price effect is just that relationship of prices of outputs to prices of inputs. So the prices that I receive for my livestock and my cattle that I sell compared to the prices that I have to pay for my fuel, my labour, uh, my machinery and so forth. Once I take out that price effect, I'm ended up, I end up with the productivity effect, which is this relationship between the physical outputs I produce on my farm, such as the quantity of milk and the quantity of livestock that I produce, divided by the physical quantities of the inputs that I use, such as fuel and labour and so forth. The interesting thing about productivity is that we can then further disaggregate its composition if we do that carefully. The first component we can look at is technological change. That's simply how much output shifts out over the future as inputs change. So how much can I physically get out of my inputs that I use over time? And if that ratio is changing over time, we'd probably think that our technological change is improving. The second concept is technical efficiency. That's how good we are at taking those technologies and getting the most out of those inputs to maximise our outputs. The third component that we can look at is scale efficiency and mix effects. And as we've talked about earlier, we've done some further work that unpicks those components where we found that scale has relatively constant returns to scale for productivity. We're not talking about profit here, just for productivity. And that means that generally we find that for an increase in output uh, inputs by 1%, we generally find an increase in outputs by 1% across different types of farm scales. Mix effect is once we're at scale and we have our given technologies, how can we alter and tweak those inputs at the margin to try and improve our productivity? The third component is the environmental effects. And they're things such as rainfall, temperature, topography, soils and so forth that all impact on our ability to convert inputs to outputs. And we try to account for those effects so that we don't uh, under estimate their impacts on productivity, about how productivity is measured. Now, remembering we're talking about 850 farms over 20 years where we've got annual revenue and cost data, so their farm financial data. What we try and do is convert that to physical inputs, physical outputs, such as the kilograms of milk solids produced, kilograms of livestock sold. And we divide it by all those physical inputs that are used on the farm, such as tons of fertilizer and so forth. And obviously we're gonna have some inputs that aren't necessarily physical in the real world sense. So we have things such as capital and other bits and pieces that are really hard to divide up into physical quantities. We take those costs and we divide them through by relevant prices to give us a quasi quantity effect that's comparable across farms. When we think about productivity growth, we often think that productivity increases when we have output increasing relative to input. That's true but it's a little bit simplistic because there's a variety of routes that we can have productivity increasing. Uh, for example, my output may stay the same, but my inputs fall. My outputs may increase at a greater rate than my inputs and so forth. And similarly, we can do the same analogously for productivity falling. So we just need to remember that it's not as simple as simply outputs rising relative to inputs or inputs rising relative to outputs. There's more subtleties to this that we need to understand. Before we get into breaking up the um, regional uh, composition, let's just remind ourselves of where we're sitting nationally and at a state level. So we see um, Tasmania, yes, we've talked about that doing relatively well over a recent period of time. We see Victoria bouncing up out of uh, drought and then slowly weakening over time. And we've seen uh, some bounce arounds in say uh, Queensland and, and New South Wales. But generally we find those states such as Victoria and um, Tasmania at relatively higher levels of productivity overall than um, some of the other regions. So that's important to understand. And we also need to understand that those state and national levels mask a considerable amount of diversity uh, in variation at a regional scale. I'm gonna take you through some of that. 
we see that, for example, the rise up in Queensland. Let's just have a bit of a, a bit of a dive into the Darling Downs and see what's going on there. So for each region, we're able to produce these graphs of composition of productivity, and we're able to look then at its relationship to profitability and the terms of trade for each region as well. In the Darling Downs, we saw productivity decline from uh, an early, early high there in the early 2000s down in 2007, 2008. Well, surprisingly, that decline in productivity wasn't necessarily all a bad story. When we look at what's going on in that decline, we actually see a fall off in livestock sales and we see a rise in input use that indicated to us a preparation for better times. For example, we saw some rises in imported metabolizable energy, uh, concentrated feed into the farm systems. We saw a lot of investment in farm um, pasture improvement and a lot of investment in repairs and maintenance. Perhaps they were readying themselves for 2008, 2009 and 10. We also find that that general shape of the productivity curve or the productivity lines was closely mirrored by technological, um, uh, sorry, um, mix efficiency changes over the period. Um, and we saw a general improvement in mix efficiency um, from about 2007, 2008. Let's have a look then for it in relation to profitability. Well, that fall in 2007, 2008 really dropped off the overall profit that we could have achieved in that period of time as the terms of trade rose. But also at the other end of the scheme, we saw some improvements in, in profitability relative to the terms of trade as productivity rose slightly over the latter period of the, of the graph. So that was quite interesting. And we also see two key peaks in the terms of trade, which were largely driven by milk scarcity uh, in that region. Let's have a talk about Victoria. So in Victoria, let's, we can see that Gippsland has the highest productivity, closely followed by the Southwest and then Northern Victoria. And we see Gippsland and the Southwest tracking with relatively similar patterns of productivity, which probably reflect similar types of farming systems as we know, similar types of rainfall and weather conditions that occurred over that period. And we also know that Northern Victoria's performance is going to be dominated by those irrigation conditions and allocations that occurred. And we know that they were incredibly low there in the early parts of that decade and didn't really improve to about the 2010s. We also need to remind ourselves in the southern systems uh, of Australia, the dairy industry not only was affected significantly by climate over the period, but there were seismic events through the um, recovery post drought in a lot of the dry farming systems with that coincided with very high commodity prices and then a sudden collapse in commodity prices through the GFC. Probably something we don't want to remember and recall, but uh, it's a reality. The other hard reality, the other large seismic shift was the MH17 disaster, which significantly impacted on world prices and also coincided at the time with the collapse of Murray Goulburn. And we know the, the price implications that that had and the devastating effects that that had. Those two important bookends need to be in the back of our mind when we think about productivity performance in southern systems in Australia. So let's unpick uh, each of those. Um, let's first turn to Northern Victoria. Some really interesting snapshots can come out of this. And again, it's important to think about this over the long term. We're going to pick out some little bits and pieces uh, at different points along the, the time periods just for interest so people can understand what might have been going on there. And I'll, I'll ask at the end of this graph, maybe if Tom uh, Farron can jump in and give us his insights about what's going on there, I'd, I'd really appreciate that. So we had a rise up in um, productivity as milk commodity prices rose in that early uh, or the latter part of the 2000s. And there was you know, improving confidence with, with milk prices. And what also happened, it was also during a period of very low water availability allocations. And we saw farmers continuing to you know, invent and improve their farming systems in response to that and their feed systems. And we certainly see a rise up in technical efficiency down the bottom there during that period. And we certainly see a rise up in mix efficiency over the period. But after the drop off in 2008, 2009, we see a general weakening in mix efficiency. Um, 
And that's interesting to understand because it then impacted upon productivity over the remaining bit of the period. Let's have a look at the profitability composition for Northern Victoria as a result of that. What's interesting here is just let, let's look at the dark blue line and the gray line. Um, we can see that the dark blue line is the terms of trade. So that's how our prices of outputs relative to inputs are moving to one another over time and it's an index. And we look at profitability. So revenue minus costs and how that's moving over time. And we see that they're very closely, the patterns are very closely related. So it tells us that the terms of trade are having a significant effect on uh, profitability. Look also at in 2007, 2008, 09, where when we had the GFC come along and, and smash um, milk prices, productivity actually responded. And we had an improvement. And remember in that previous graph, we had an improvement in mix efficiency at that point in time where farmers turned things around a bit and were able to alter their inputs in a way and alter their outputs in a way where they tried to minimise the impacts on profitability as a result of that. And we see some, some outcomes as a result of that. Also, during that middle period of this um, length of analysis, uh, between, say, 2010 through to about 2015, we see a general improvement up in productivity and then a flatlining. That general rise up in productivity enabled a widening gap between the terms of trade and profitability. So we had relatively more profitable period during that period of time than, than the other periods that we're talking about. Also notice a really significant difference here to compared to the first uh, bit around 2008, 2009, where we look at 2015 and 16, and then the collapse in the milk prices, we actually see a deterioration in productivity. And what we saw there was mix efficiency dropping off uh, during that period. And that decline in productivity actually had a negative impact on profitability relative to the terms of trade. So we saw a weakening of profitability more so than probably what could have happened if we were able to um, turn that around and improve our productivity. So at that point, I'd, I'd kind of be interested in um, if Tom's about, Tom Farron, if he's about in the, in the chat, I'd love him to um, just give us a few comments on that. Yeah, thanks, Gav. So I just want to, as you said, ground truth a little bit of what these graphs are telling us. And I think you've picked up on most of the key points, with a key one being that 2006-07 period was the first of a four-year drought um, up in northern Victoria, which resulted in low irrigation allocations. And I think what resulted there was a lot of farms um, had a bit of low-hanging fruit to harvest as such around the way they were feeding cows. And so we used to always talk about the November crash for example, that always happened when the pasture quality went off. Um, farmers learnt that they could still feed their cows well all year round. And I think that's the, that, yeah, understanding how to manage those systems where they weren't reliant on pasture all the time has resulted in a lot of that productivity growth during that period. Um, and then the other key period, as you pointed out, was the 2015-16 period. Um, so for people that aren't familiar with the region, what tend to happen then was 2015 was actually a drought year. So we had high prices, um, which resulted a lot of perennial pastures being dried off, a lot of annual pastures going in. Um, farmers are really struggling to make money before Murray Goulburn and Fonterra dropped the price in April, I think it was 2016. Um, so it was low profitability, but then 2016 up here was a very wet year. Um, and this region for most farms really don't cope with wet conditions. And it was wet from June till end of October. Um, and that put the change of our farm systems away from perennials and, and into annual type systems and into PMR, so partial mixed rations, but put them under a lot of stress, those wet conditions. So it wasn't uncommon for, cow, for herds to lose 25% or more of their cows due to the wet conditions, such as um, lameness and other issues with it, and cows being dried off early and stuff like that. And the, the personal stress that it had the farmers under was extraordinary that year. It's the worst I've seen it out of all the tough years we've had. And I think the way that, um, I think the actual mental space that left the farmers in has a bit to do with what's happening in the following years from it. Um, yeah, people can't just bounce back overnight from that sort of stress. Yeah. So thanks, Gav. Thanks heaps, Tom. That's um, really brought a bit more colour and movement to that. And uh, again, I do stress that, yes, we do talk about lines and numbers, but real people, real consequences. Let's now turn to the Southwest. So remembering that, uh, in the southwest, we've got relatively similar patterns to to uh, to Gippsland. Um, we had an improvement bounce out 
in that um, late 2000s out of drought productivity improved, but largely declined thereafter. And generally we saw mix efficiency deteriorating over that period. Once we got to about 2008, 2009, we saw a general weakening of, of mix efficiency. Those falls in productivity between 2009, 2010, down to 2011, 12, quite interesting when you go back and bury into um, what's going on there with inputs relative to outputs, we certainly saw an, a really a, a substantial increase in imported feed. We saw a lot more um, high repairs and maintenance and we saw high capital expenditure. And so there was a bit of an expansion period that went on there in the Southwest that um, drop down productivity, but probably had something to say about productivity, you know, um, being maintained then around 2013, 2014 and so forth. Um, we saw a tick up in productivity in 2016, 17. And that seems to be generally, when we look at the data, it seems to be generally associated with higher rainfall um, and lower irrigation and, and generally lower imported feed to the farm systems. And that seems to be explaining what's, what's gone on there. Let's turn to uh, the profitability composition and won't dwell on this one too much, but just look at the difference here. Again, looking at those two bookend periods of 2008 uh, or thereabouts and post 2015-16, we had a bounce out in both year, in both those periods in the Southwest in contrast to what occurred in, in Northern Victoria. And it makes a difference to, uh, um, to profitability. We also see that in the Southwest, profitability and the terms of trade are really closely linked here. Um, um, really tightly, tightly um, connected. And it's because we're not seeing those substantial movements in productivity in the way that we saw some of those bounce outs in productivity and declines in productivity that we saw in Northern Victoria. Let's finally turn to Gippsland. This is uh, the last set of slides that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, again, reminding ourselves that Gippsland looks a lot like the Southwest in terms of productivity trends and performance. Again, another early bounce out. From the, from the 2000s, commodity price boom, uh, boom. And then we saw it largely fluctu fluctuating in and around those gains over time. Um, and similarly, we saw mix efficiency peak early and then just uh, tended to drop off. And what we seem to see, particularly where it drops most substantially, say in 2012, 2013, is probably the impact of having um, a variety of farms in the Gippsland sample, uh, including the MID, uh, we've had um, some of the changes in rainfall and irrigation use were having a big impact on productivity movements. So we saw a, a drop off in rainfall and increase in irrigation in that period. Um, and uh, we've sort of, since 2015-16, we've seen some uh, minor positive improvements in, in mix efficiency over time. Let's finally look at um, the profitability composition for, for Gippsland. Again, we've got that um, that difference in bookend story and quite similar to um, the Southwest where we see those positive bounce outs in 07, 08 uh, and 08, 09. And similarly, um, post 2015, 16 um, had positive impacts on um, profitability. And we also see a little bit of a slight difference in that widening of the gap between profitability and the terms of trade in Gippsland compared to the Southwest. Uh, because we're seeing a bit more of the movement in productivity relative to and higher productivity relative to uh, the southwest. And with that, um, I'm happy to uh, end it there and uh, move on to questions. Fantastic, Gav. Thank you. Um, look, your knowledge in interpreting this data is certainly second to none and appreciate Tom's regional commentary and insights there. Um, so as you said, Gav, now we move into um, the really exciting part of our session, uh, which is our Q&A. Um, it's fair to say we have received some absolute thumper questions um, through the productivity email. And I guess what I get really excited about is the fact that people are genuinely listening to what's being said here. Uh, they're reading the report and they are still wanting to delve deeper, which shows just how important this work is. With that being said, some questions were really highly technical and we wouldn't have the time to tackle them here. So with all questions, we will be providing written answers and responses um, to all of them and they'll be sent out to everyone who registered for the forum as well. So let's launch into our first question. The first one, um, John Hauser from XCheck, um, he was one of the people that submitted a number of highly technical questions. So thank you, John. 
Um, but what I thought I'll do is I'll summarise a few of his questions by stating that he was chasing some confidence on how productivity is actually calculated in this piece of work. So Dan, um, I'm wondering whether you can help me out with this one. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, and yeah, this total factor productivity, it clearly is much more complex to calculate than just dividing one number by another, which is how most of the partial measures that we're more familiar with are calculated. It is a lot more complex and, and I'd have, I've got to admit that I'm not likely to understand all the algebra involved in that anytime soon. So I guess my, I guess my way of thinking it through is that the, the process that um, Chris O'Donnell went through who developed this method and the refereeing and peer reviewing that his work's gone through gives me a pretty high level of confidence that it's coming from a very strong theoretical base. And I guess in terms of what I've seen in, um, in terms of the data matching up with what we've seen on the ground, I would, I would um, say that, uh, you know, it, it seems to be passing the common sense test in terms of being able to explain what we've seen on the ground fairly well. Uh, probably in terms of, of um, application, there's probably a little bit of work to do in terms of trying to incorporate the, the weather and climatic stuff a bit more, um, a bit more rigorously. But by and large, it seems to me like the, the results are passing the common sense test in terms of what we're seeing on the ground. Thanks, Sarah. Awesome, Dan. Thank you. And look, I agree. I don't think the specific calculations are needed here, um, but it's great to hear that you have confidence in the data. And I think we've seen that ground truth with our other panel, member, panel members too. Um, all right, moving on to the next question. Uh, Craig Dwyer from Cobden in Southwest Victoria uh, contacted us. Um, he's been watching this productivity work very closely and he emailed us suggesting that any study on productivity and profitability is incomplete unless we do so against the context of a growth target. So therefore, we interpret your question, Craig, as being a challenge for industry to first quantify where it wants to be in terms of total litres. Now, Tom, this is a tough one, but I'd love to go to you for comment. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So I'm not going to try and put words into Craig's mouth because I don't know exactly what he meant, but I often hear this talked about, the, the talking about how much um, milk the industry as a whole in Australia produces. And I reckon that that's generally because the view that's held is that the, the amount we produce as a whole can be measured if we're successful or not. So the more we produce, the more successful the dairy industry is, and the less we produce or the more it shrinks, the, the more it's not working. Um, but that's from what I understand. That's not really what this report is, where it's coming from. Um, it's, and it's not quite potentially understanding the difference between total production and productivity. And so I reckon I might hand over to Gav or Dan to answer um, in a bit more detail about why that is. Thanks, yeah, Tom. So, Gav, we'd love to come to you next. Okay, it's um, love your surname, Craig. Um, unfortunately, we're not related, but uh, there you go. Uh, look, I think it's a really great question, and I'm not just saying that because of your name. Um, it, it's a terrific question because it's sort of this existential issue of where is the industry going, where does it want to be, and that's a strategic question. Um, what this is about is saying that really let's let's step to one side and just say. We want farmers to be as competitive as they can, as profitable uh, as, uh, as they can. This focus is around productivity as the route to achieving that and trying to boost your productivity as much as you can enables farmers to vote with their feet about where they think the industry will go. Ultimately, by putting farmers into the most competitive position they can be enables them to decide how big their industry will be because it will, it will then determine how many resources they seek to use on their farm and so forth and how they seek to invest and, and so forth. I think ultimately the decision on how big the industry is is one for farmers to decide by how, how they vote with the feet. Obviously that can be influenced by how much we try and shape and influence productivity and that's going to get determined by how we shape and influence uh, our R&D decisions and how much we're prepared to spend for that. And that's a question not just for industry, but also for government as well. 
Thanks, Gav. And you're right, it is, it's a big question and a big conversation um, for, for industry and others. Um, so Dan, I would like to come to you and see if you've got any final comments or thoughts on, on this before we move on. Yeah, I guess it, like this is a question that does warrant more than a short answer, but in a nutshell, I'd say the, the thing that's gonna determine how big this industry is, is how much land and water resources we can get within our control and that's going to be largely shaped by not just our own competitiveness, but the competitors for land and water and how competitive they are with us. And hopefully next week, we're going to hear a bit more about it in the forum next week, Gavin. Thanks, Dan. Awesome. Look, thanks for the great question, Craig. And I think it's certainly one that warrants some further conversation outside of here as well. Um, all right, I'd like to move along to our next question. Um, and it came in from um, a farm business specialist and rural financial counsellor, Jim Mole, who's located in Benalla in Victoria. Um, now, like John, um, Jim sent an, us a number of questions and we'll answer most of them in writing, but we've selected this one um, to put forward um, to the forum audience. So Jim writes, the current capacity of many dairy farm managers to make change is questionable. The skill levels of farm managers now needs to be higher to implement higher level new technologies. How will this be addressed in coming years, he asks. Until dairy farmers become skilled at managing a business, I don't think we are going to see productivity increasing by a lot. So Gav, I'm wondering if I can start with you on this one. Well, that's a, that's a really good question, Jim. Um, before I start, I'd preface by saying that when we look at productivity performance in this analysis, we're basing it on um, dairy farm monitor and QDAS data. Now, arguably, there's a bias in that data set that, um, you know, we've got some pretty strong farms and farmers uh, in that data set. So arguably, the performance of industry as a whole might be on average a fair bit weaker or possibly weaker than what we're finding in this study. Uh, and it certainly is likely to be demonstrated more in the idea that um, we're going to have fewer farms technically efficient. So it's not going to shift the technological boundaries of what's achievable, because if we think about it in this data set, we've got some pretty good, big, good, good farms, small and big farms and medium sized farms achieving that. So they set that boundary. But we're probably going to find by doing a wider sample of a wider diversity of farm manager skills, that uh, we might see fewer fewer of them at that technological frontier. Um, so, uh, yeah, good question. I think um, it's it's one for further further conversation in the industry. Thanks, Gav. And look now, Tom, you're up in Northern Vic, um, not too far from Vanilla, um, uh, and you probably know Jim probably quite well. I'd just like to go to you for your thoughts. Um, yeah. So I think Jim raises a good point. And there's a theme of some questions that come through that were similar, saying that as we talk about in this report that the technical efficiency in Australia dairy farms is pretty good, but that's not necessarily uniform across the board. So there's certainly some farms that have got definitely scope to improve um, and then they could get more out of their inputs and the technology available to them. I think my take from it is that saying that overall as an industry, we're, we're doing fairly well at, at at this though, so why we can get those farmers potentially to improve more um, as an industry as a whole, that's probably not where the big changes are going to come from. So we're not going to get the big productivity growth from, from focusing on the farmers that aren't performing quite as well. Um, I think that my take, once again, it's a personal take, not a, anything else, is that the new technology coming through is where the, the biggest gains are going to come from. And I just want to clarify what I mean by technology. So a lot of people, when they think technology, they're thinking electronic type stuff. Um, but I'm really talking about all things, so biological things as well. So I heard from um, some of the dairy farmers earlier on about um, GMOs and those sorts of things. Because I think back to what made some of the big changes in the last 40 years, um, there are things like the superphosphate coming in, the things like Roundup, urea, grain feeding, AI breeding coming through. So we had those big game changing things come along and I can't recall any of those in the last 20 years actually coming available to farmers. So, so that's when I'm saying technology, I'm referring to those things every bit as much as robots and computers and software and, and things that make it actually harder for the farmers to manage what is already um, an increasingly difficult operation to run. So thanks, Sarah. 
Thanks, Tom. Um, look, and in the nature of time, I will keep moving through um, to our next question, but I think that's another great clarification, Tom, around what we mean by technology. Now, you met um, our wonderful Western Australian dairy farmer, Jackie Bidoff, earlier in our opening panel. Um, Jackie and her husband, Bob, have participated in the Dairy Farm Monitor Program for a number of years now. Um, it's a major source of Gavin's data, as we know. And so Jackie wrote to us and pointed out that there is often criticism from some farmers that the Dairy Farm Monitor Program and QDAS data is populated by perhaps a particular type of farmer and that it may not represent the average in the state and that the average might actually be in a worse position than represented by industry data. So Dan, as a consultant who has played a big role in Dairy Farm Monitor Project data collection, what is your response to Jackie? Yeah, it's it's a valid point. Um, and I think that, you know, when you're asking for the level of detail and quality of data that we ask for to calculate productivity, you are going to have to go to people that do have reasonable records and you are going to have to go to people that have some sort of interest in providing that sort of information. So there's no doubt that the sample is biased towards people that are more interested in this type of analysis. We still, though, do find a, a really substantial range in profit and productivity within the people that are interested. So uh, I, I think there, there probably is a bias to possibly an above average farm in terms of profitability and productivity, but we still have a, a vast range in terms of profit and productivity. I think the other thing that we need to be really mindful with this is that the focus of this analysis is on changes in productivity over time. And so anything that we do to try and get a less biased sample, it can't compromise in terms of data quality and it can't compromise in terms of continuity of farms over time because the the value of continuity in farms and quality data over time far outweighs anything you lose in terms of having a slight bias in the sample. Thanks, Dan. Um, and look, moving right along, um, on a similar vein to, to Jackie's question, um, Phil White, a consultant from Southwest Victoria, wanted to know what makes us so sure that productivity gains from ag agronomy um, and et cetera have already been made? Um, he sees plenty of farms where improvements in basic agronomy can still lead to major increases in productivity. Um, so, Tom, I might come to you for that one. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So, first, I'd just like to state that I, I agree with Phil. There's certainly um, plenty of farms out there that have got improvement in the agronomy area. Um, in fact, most farms most likely do. It's just similar answer to what I said to answer Jim Mole's question is that it's saying, I think to get the biggest productivity increase in Australia, it's, it's more focusing on we're already doing as a whole reasonably well in these areas. Um, we've got technical efficiency in the mid 90s, or low 90% mark already. Um, it's not going to see massive gains by improving those, those farmers. Um, so it's really saying I think the focus needs to be on improving those productivity, like those technologies coming through. Um, and I referenced that the, the, how I drew the conclusion last week between potentially it's the agronomy side or the pasture side that's holding the industry back more so than the cow and nutrition side was in relation to um, what some of the other countries are doing around the world in terms of productivity. So for example, New Zealand seems to have fairly well stalled in productivity as well, um, which is a pasture-based system. Whereas the USA, for example, seems to be going, having better productivity growth, which is a more of a feedlot type system as a whole. There's always exceptions. Um, and that's despite the US having profitability issues, their productivity has continued to grow. Um, so that was where that relation, that's where I drew, drew that conclusion that maybe it's the agronomy side of it, but I drew it as not as saying that is a fact, that is just purely where I'm starting to think it might be to try and encourage a, a deeper investigation into that area. Awesome, Tom. Thank you. Um, and look, I know it's hard to um, just stop here when there is so much more to say. I think we could stay on here for hours and, and discuss these questions. Um, and that's exactly why this forum really is the start of the conversation that needs to you know, continue in many forms. I am mindful of time. So um, firstly, I would like to thank everyone who did submit questions to us and please keep them coming. These questions really help us gauge what we need to include, uh, what we need to clarify and where we need to centre our 
our focus with these forums. We'll try and answer as many questions as possible in these forums, but do remember that we will circulate written answers to all of them. Now, just like that, um, another exciting se session has come and gone. Uh, and I'd like to thank each and every person that has been involved today by taking on the hard task of sharing their thoughts on this work. Um, it really is no easy feat, and we appreciate the value that each person's um, contribution brings. Now, next week's session is certainly not one to miss. It's where all this productivity work reaches a critical point. Not only will we hear from Gavin about what productivity um, means with regards to dairy competing for land, water, and other resources from other industries, but we'll also hear from David Nation about what this means for the dairy industry more broadly and how this productivity work will influence the future of our d &E investment. Thank you all for being a key part of this important conversation and we'll see you back next week to tie it all together. Goodbye.